Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Immediately upon leaving the garden, what did Adam do? Adam knew Eve. And she what? Conceived. Obviously, that's a deeper knowledge than, oh, I know who you are, you're my wife. That is a knowledge that resulted in fruit. Fruit that was in the likeness of Adam, by the way, by the law, the physical law of heredity. Please understand, this is the gospel according to marriage. And this has a direct spiritual application. In the Greek language, in the New Testament, we are told there in Luke that Joseph did not know Mary, and yet she what? Conceived by whom? The Holy Spirit. So clearly, in both Hebrew and in Greek, the verb to know is used in reference to conception. And obviously, so it is in the English language, because we have translated both the Hebrew and the Greek with the verb to know. Clearly then, my dear friends, to know the truth involves a much more intimate relationship to the truth than just intellectual assent, doesn't it? Obviously. If we are to experience the liberating power of the truth, it must not only be grasped with the intellect and embraced with the affections, but it must be submitted to with the will. Wilma has to say yes to him who is the truth and thereby conceive it. Do I hear an amen? Last night, we considered how it is that when Wilma says yes to the lusts of the flesh, lust hath what? Conceived. And what is the next step? Birth. Ask any mother. And then growth and death. For the fruit of the marriage union to sin, self, and Satan is death, sin and death. But praise God, my dear friends, Wilma is set free from that tyrannical marriage union. Amen? She is set free to become married to another. And though the old man, because we die to him by faith, and faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, though the old man still hangs around in the household of me and continually tries to seduce Wilma and get her to be unfaithful to her new spiritual husband, and though she can, in the strength of Christ and for the love of Christ, refuse to consent to those seductive advances and send them back to the grave where they came from, that's only half her job. That's only what, class? Half her job. You see, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are what? Contrary one to another. So, while Wilma must say no to the lusts of the flesh, she must also say what? Yes. yes, to the desire of the Spirit. And right there you have what it really means to know the truth. And when she consents to the desire of of the spirit, the desire of her spiritual husband communicated to her through her conscience, then the desire of the spirit has conceived. Amen? And there is in the womb of the mind the embryo of the fruit of the spirit. And she can, by the spiritual law of heredity, bear fruit that is in the likeness 
of the spiritual husband. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Now, this truth that we must know, what is it? Psalm 119, verse 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your what? Your law is truth. What do you suppose it would mean, then, to know the truth? It would mean to grasp the law with the intellect, to understand, in other words, God's requirements, God's will for our life. But is that all? No. We must embrace the law with our affections. We must be able to honestly say, how love I thy law. Amen? But is even that enough, my dear friends? No. Thirdly, we must what? Submit the will without reservation to the claims of the lawgiver. Do I hear an amen? After all, he's our husband. And if we love our husband, will we be reticent and unwilling to submit to his authority? No, my dear friends. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And by the way, that's the only way you can keep the commandments, if you love him. Do I hear an amen? Why? Because love is the fulfilling of the law. If you are keeping the commandments for any other reason than love for the lawgiver, you aren't even really obeying. You're only faking it. It's only hypocrisy. It's only a pretense. It's only whitewash. Please understand that. You see, we have a different way of evaluating behavior than God does. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks where? At the heart. We think that because in the realm of behavior we have complied with the letter of the law, we've obeyed. Is that necessarily true? No, dear friend. Please know that. You see, the husband, the, our, our spiritual husband, Jesus Christ, is not nearly as interested in what we do or what we don't do as he is in why we do it and why we didn't do it. Motive is everything with God. And the motive behind one and the same act can make it either pleasing to God or repulsive to God. Did you hear that? I want to repeat that. The motive behind one and the same act can make it either pleasing to God or repulsive to God. It's the spirit in which we do things that makes all the difference with God. And does he know the motive behind our behavior? Does he, my dear friends? Oh, he reads our hearts like an open book. You can't fool God. You might fool others. You might even have yourself fooled. But you can't fool God. What else is the truth? Not only the law, but John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your what? Your word is truth. Okay. What would be involved in knowing the truth as it is the Word of God then? It would be knowing the doctrines of the Bible, right? The teachings. But is that enough? No. You must take the second step. You must embrace with the affections the truth as it is the Word of God. You must love the Bible. You must what? Love the Bible. My dear friends, I ask you, be honest with yourself. Does the amount of time you spend with the Bible prove that you really love it? Don't resent me for asking that question. It's for your own good. 
what we really love inevitably gets the lion's share of our time. Are you with me? Will you admit that? You know, I've often said, and I must say it tonight, that if we as a people during the last 20 years had spent as much time studying the Bible as we've spent watching TV, we would have been in the kingdom a long time ago. We love our passive entertainment, don't we? And it gets a lot of our hours in the day. And my dear friends, please know that if you claim to love the Bible and yet are spending very little time, if any, in the study of it, you're fooling yourself. Can I be real blunt with you and real honest with you? Are you, are you willing to let me do that? You're fooling yourself. And if you don't really love the truth, you aren't set free by the truth. Knowing the truth as it is the Word of God involves then not only loving it, but it also involves what? Submitting to it. Yielding to its every claim in your daily life where the rubber meets the road. Ultimately, what is the truth? John chapter 14, verse 6. And Jesus said, I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Who is ultimately the truth? The bridegroom. Bride of Christ. The bridegroom himself. You see, he is the law personified. He is the Word made flesh. Therefore, He is ultimately the truth. It's Jesus. Now, what would be involved in knowing the truth as it is Jesus if we're going to be set free? What would be involved? It would mean understanding who He is with our minds. Is that important? Yes. Is that enough? No. It means loving with your whole heart who He is, embracing Him. Have you done that? I'm not asking you these questions intending a public answer tonight, but I am asking you to ask yourself, have you embraced the truth as it is Jesus with your whole heart? What's a good way of helping you know whether you've really done that or not? May I give you a very practical test? Listen to yourself talk. What does Jesus himself say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What do we talk about the most? Come on now. Be really honest, candid with me. What do we talk about the most? That which we love the most. That which is most important to us. You know that. Come on, you can't deny that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So then, please follow with me. Be honest. Don't weasel out of this one. If we really love Jesus supremely, what will inevitably be the favorite theme of our conversation? What will it be? Jesus, of course. Will we find it difficult to talk about Jesus? No, we will find it difficult not to talk about Jesus. Come on now. You remember, guys, when you were dating her? And she was front and center in your thought life all the time, and you made yourself obnoxious talking about her all the time? And that's just... Human love. 
If we truly love Jesus, my friends, he will fill our hearts to overflowing, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. I ask you again, have you embraced the truth with your heart as it is Jesus? Have you? And what's the third step? Have you yielded your will without reservation to Jesus Christ? Do you begin each day and go through that day saying, not my will, but thine be done? That's what it means to know the truth as it is Jesus. And my dear friends, it's not until you have that kind of knowledge that you will be set free from the tyranny of sin, self, and Satan. And you see, what, what we're doing right here is identifying the reason why so many of us are still in bondage to old habits, to hereditary and cultivated tendencies, and we just can't manage to break free. We haven't come to know the truth. That's the reason. Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Listen to these remarkable words. This is the bridegroom speaking to you, bride of Christ. Please hear him. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. You shall what? Know the Lord. Now, in the context of betrothal, what kind of knowledge is that? That is the most intimate knowledge that will result in fruit-bearing. Do I hear an amen? Do you have that kind of relationship with the bridegroom? You must if you are going to ever be a part of that wife who's made herself ready, my dear friends. You must. You see, John 15, verse 16. Listen to Jesus again. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and what? Bear fruit. Go and what? Bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Oh, friends. Jesus wants a fruitful bride. Do I hear an amen? He doesn't want us to be barren, unfruitful. He wants us to know him. And in that intimate spiritual union to conceive the fruit of the Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit. Do you know the truth? By their fruits you shall know them. Galatians chapter 5. What is the fruit that your life will manifest if you know the truth? But the fruit of the Spirit is love. On top of the list, it's what? It's love. In fact, you can make a good argument that there ought to be a colon after that. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And all the rest of the fruit simply define what love is. What's love? It's joy, it's peace, it's long-suffering, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. 
Those are all virtues or aspects of love. You see, the bridegroom is the prince of love. Amen? And when we know him, the fruit that will be the result of that union will be in his likeness. Is his character likeness being manifested more and more fully in your life, dear friend? Is it? If it isn't, then please, please be alarmed and flee to the foot of the cross and get married to Jesus. Say, I die to the old man and say, I do to Jesus. And allow him to fulfill his marriage covenant with you. It's called the new covenant. What is it? I will write my law where? In their heart and in their mind. Allow him to motivate you with the spirit of love and submit your will to him. And motivated by love and empowered by his spirit, your will will be supernaturally enabled not only to consistently repulse the seductive advances of the old man, but will be consistently enabled to consent to the desires of the Spirit. And your life will become fruitful. And you will bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is ultimately love. Romans 13, verse 10. Since love is the fulfillment of the law, if your heart is governed by love, Will obedience to the law be a problem for you? Will it be something that you have to make yourself do? Will you even think of it as a requirement that you are obligated to comply with? No, my brother, my sister. If your heart is motivated by love and you love the lawgiver supremely, then you will find obedience your greatest delight. Do I hear an amen? That's another way you can test the genuineness of your Christian experience. Ask yourself, honestly, what is my attitude towards obedience to the law? If it's primarily thought of by you as a duty, something that's required of you, that's a red flag. If you have the love of Christ in your heart, obedience will not be thought of as a duty, it will be your greatest delight. And you will be honestly able to say, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Why? Thy law is within my heart. And if obedience is primarily a duty, it's because the law isn't where? Within your heart. It may be in your intellect, but it hasn't been embraced by your affections and your will hasn't been submitted to it. You're just gritting your teeth and making yourself comply with the letter of the law so that you can maintain your reputation. Or perhaps earn enough points so that you can get to heaven. None of which is even obedience, is it? In fact, do you know what the Bible calls it? It calls it filthy rags. Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. I'm wrestling right now, I'm wrestling with whether or not to reveal a profound spiritual insight.
it, it's, it's, it's challenging because in this modern culture of ours, we, uh, we're not quite as earthy and as, uh, you know, down to reality as the Hebrews were. Do you know what the Hebrew expression that is translated filthy rags is? It's menstrual rags. And now all of a sudden you see the profound spiritual significance of calling our self-motivated efforts to obey menstrual rags, don't you? Can we bear fruit if we don't have a spiritual union with the bridegroom? Can we? No. What is the only thing the bride can produce without the bridegroom? Come on now. Menstrual rags. Isn't that a remarkable insight? And it's in the Bible. That's why I share it. And if Isaiah had the courage to write it, I've got to have the courage to share it. It's obscured by the English translation, filthy rags. But that's literally what the Hebrew says. And it's a profound insight, isn't it? And my dear friends, I am so, so concerned and frightened with the fact that many of us have ourselves convinced that our filthy rags are really the fruit of the Spirit. And how do I say such a thing? on the basis of the verdict of the true witness regarding this end-time church. What does he say of us? I've been over this with you before. He says that we think that we're what? Rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. And we don't even know that we are what? Wretched, poor, blind, miserable, and naked. We have ourselves self-deceived, don't we? We have ourselves convinced that our filthy rags are really adequate to make us righteous in the sight of God frightening self-deception. No wonder he pleads with us to receive from him I salve that our eyes might be anointed. What's the I salve the symbol of? The Holy Spirit. Why does the bridegroom plead with us to let him anoint our eyes with I salve so that we can see the way things really are? so that we can see past the whitewash, if you'll let me get to a more comfortable analogy than the previous one. So we can see past the whitewash and see what's behind it. You see, it doesn't take any spiritual discernment to analyze behavior. You can see what's on the outside. You can see whitewash. But where spiritual discernment is necessary is to see the motive behind all that behavior. And my dear fellow Laodiceans, we are desperate need of have, in desperate need of having our eyes anointed with eye salve. Are you with me? Will you admit that? Do I hear an amen? God help us look past the whitewash and see what's behind it all while there's still time to get real if we aren't. I'm not accusing you all of hypocrisy, but bless your hearts, the chances are pretty good since this is our identifying characteristic by the virtue, uh, by the verdict of the true witness, the chances are pretty good that there's some hypocrisy even in this building. Will you admit it? And what frightens me is that we will go on in our self-righteous self-deception until it's too late to get real, too late to get married to Jesus and we won't be ready to go home with the bridegroom. God forbid! Plead for that eye staff, for your sake.
plead for that ISAB. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and following. Now by this we know that we know him, if we what? Keep his commandments. But please don't forget, love is the fulfilling of the law. You got to keep the commandments because you love God. Not just because it's expected of you or required of you. Verse 4, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. The truth is not where? In him. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. So, bride of Christ, this leads us to the next question. How is it that we can come to have a genuine, real, powerful, maturing love for Jesus Christ? That's essential if we're going to know him. You see, please understand that no one is going to be willing to submit their will to someone they don't fully love and trust. Did you hear what we just said there? And the reason we are not inclined to, stick, to take step three, to submit the will, is because we haven't really taken step two. Embraced him who is the truth with our hearts. We haven't really come to love the truth. Yes, we have given intellectual assent to it, but we haven't really come to love it. I insist that when we really come to love the truth and trust him who is the truth, submitting our will will not be all that difficult. In fact, it will be the natural thing that we will desire to do. Are you following that? So I have to conclude then that the reason we are so reticent to yield our will to him who is the truth is because we don't really trust him. We don't really love him. So tell me, how are we going to come and love and trust him? How? To the point where we will be willing to submit our will without reservation to him. How? The answer is in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him because he what? First loved us. What is the only way, dear fellow member of the bride of Christ. What is the only way any human being can love the bridegroom? Only in response to his first loving us. Right? You cannot generate love for Christ. It is only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit as you discover how much Christ first loved you. Then you are able, if you so choose, to love him in response. Does that make sense? So, how then would we come to love him? We must take deliberate measures to understand how much he first loved us. Does that make sense? We must take what? deliberate measures to come to understand how much he first loved us. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have what? Drawn you. You see, the whole agenda of the bridegroom is to woo us, to court us, to draw us back into the holiest of wedlocks with him, that the fall terminated. 
He created us to be his helpmeet, but we divorced him 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden, and he immediately instigated and implemented the plan of salvation, and its whole purpose is to win the heart of his human bride back. And he does so by revealing his what? His loving kindness. Oh, I love that. Therefore, with loving kindness I have drawn you. Loving kindness. And my dear friends, how and where is it that we are made aware of this loving kindness that has a drawing, a, an attractive power upon our hearts and minds? How and where do we discover it? In the book that I hold in my hands. What does Jesus say about this book? These are they which testify of me. And by the way, when he said that, he was talking about which of the Testaments? The Old. The New hadn't even been written yet. And if the Old testifies of him, I insist the New does all the more. My dear fellow Laodiceans, if we are going to get hot we're going to have to grow in our love for Jesus. And please know I use the word grow, not fall. I've always been concerned about that expression falling in love. It implies temporary bliss as you plummet. But then there's a painful arrival when you hit the bottom. I much prefer the concept of growing in love. How do we grow in love, my dear friends, with the bridegroom? Come on. We have got to study and discover how much he first loved us. We have got to learn for ourselves his loving kindnesses towards us. Do I hear an amen? What then do we desperately need if we're going to move out of lukewarm into hot? What do we desperately need? We need to spend quality and quantity time every day, especially as we are running out of them. In the study of the love of God as revealed in Jesus Christ and recorded in this book. Do I hear an amen? My dear friends, in behalf of the bridegroom, I commend to you the earnest, diligent study of the Word of God. You have got to make time to get acquainted with Jesus by the study of this book. Please notice, did I say you have to find time? No, I said you have to what? Make time. Is there a difference? You know there's a difference. Let me assure you that if you just try to find time, you won't. The devil will see to it. And bless your hearts, you can be very busy doing good things. And let it crowd out the most important thing. Martha was doing good things in the kitchen. But Mary did the better thing sitting at the feet of Jesus. And it's tough, I know, living in the Martha world like we do, to find time to sit at the feet of Jesus. That's why you got to make time. You have got to what? Make time. My dear friends, don't any one of you dare claim that you don't have time. Come on now, don't go there. We have time for what's most important to us, don't we? You know that. It's not a question of whether or not you have time. It's a question then of your priorities. Will you admit that? I hope you don't resent me for being so blunt with you here. But my dear friends, we play games with ourselves and we need to be helped out of that routine, don't we? Well, I just don't have any time. 
I, I just can't fit it into my nonsense. You just haven't got your priorities straightened out yet. And what is priority number one, my dear friends? If you and I are going to be a part of that bride who has made herself ready, I ask you, what's priority number one? It's spending quality time getting acquainted with the love of Jesus Christ as revealed in that book. There is no higher priority. I have a question for you tonight. Does your daily schedule manifest that fact? Does it? You don't have to answer that publicly, but you better ask yourself privately. Please, for your sake and Christ's sake, make time. Sit down and give him the first and the best time, which happens to be first thing in the morning. Do I hear an amen? Which requires some very practical adjustments, perhaps. For starters, get in the bed at a decent hour. Come on now. Which will mean you've got to eliminate TV, which will be the best thing you ever did. The servant of the Lord tells us that every hour of sleep before midnight is worth two after. You try it, you'll find it's true. You get to bed at 9 o'clock, you'll wake up at 4 feeling bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to spend the best time with Jesus Christ. That's uh, if you went to bed with an empty stomach. Oh, now he's stopped preaching and he's really meddling. Bless your hearts, I need to talk a little physiology here with you. You go to bed with a full stomach and your poor stomach's got to work on that mass that you downloaded. And it's trying to get some rest and you're trying to get some sleep, but it's got to do its job. And so your rest is not very refreshing. And you wake up in the morning with dragon mouse. You light a candle at 20 paces with your breath. It's because that food is rotting. Brushing your teeth doesn't solve the problem. Going to bed with your supper digested solves the problem. Do I hear an amen? Which means you eat like a king for breakfast, you eat like a prince for lunch, and you eat like a pauper, if at all, for supper. Do I hear an amen? Well, I'm not very hearty. I wasn't planning on saying any of this, but somebody needs this out there. My friends, you see, if we're going to get serious, if we are going to really make time, it will require some significant adjustment of our present schedule and habits and practices. But is it worth it? My friends, it'll be eternally worth it. Please. We don't have time to continue with the status quo. Do I hear an amen? We got to make radical changes if we're going to be ready for Jesus to come. You can't go on same old, same old anymore. That's why we're still here, because it's been same old, same old for years. We got to start getting serious about our relationship with Jesus. Serious. Make radical changes. Oh, sure, it'll put you out of harmony with the rest of the world, but so be it. We're supposed to come apart and be separate anyway. Oh, yeah, you might get flack. You might be called fanatical. You might be called weird. So be it. So was Jesus. You're in good company. By the way, when we start getting serious about our relationship with Jesus and start living a real Christ-like life, we're going to start getting persecuted. And I need to make the rest of the observation. The reason we aren't being persecuted now is because we're so much like the world, the world is entirely comfortable with us.
And I tell you that in love. My dear friends, make whatever changes you got to make, but make time for Jesus. Make time for the study of God's Word. Do I hear an amen? You know what I want to recommend? It's been a personal practice of mine, and I've found it to be of inestimable value and blessing. I keep a copy of The Desire of Ages by my bedside. And first thing every morning, I spend quality and quantity time reading that book. I can't tell you how many times I've been through it. I've lost count. But every time, it's a brand new book, and it's a profound blessing. What I recommend is this. At the beginning of every chapter, there's little brackets at the bottom of the page that give you the Scripture texts of which the chapter is an inspired commentary. Read those first. Therefore, have your Bible there with the Desire of Ages. And then proceed to read the chapter, the inspired commentary. And what do you do when you get to the end of the book? Start over again. Try it. It'll change your life. You see, as you read Scripture and the inspired commentary in the spirit of prophecy on the love of God as revealed in Jesus Christ, as you begin to understand more and more fully how much He first loved you, as you pray that the Holy Spirit will help you to do so, you will respond in ever-growing love for Him. I promise you, I promise you, you will. And the more you love him, the more you will trust him. And the more you love and trust him, the more you will be willing to submit your will to him without reservation. Until you find it your greatest joy and delight in total submission to your divine husband. And you rejoice in the law of the husband. Your desire is for him, and he rules over you. And you are happier than you will ever have been before in your life. I promise you that. But that'll never happen if you don't take deliberate measures to come to know how much he first loved you because that's the only way you can possibly love him in response. Are we all clear on this? Listen to the broken-hearted complaint of the spurned lover of souls. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8. These people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now you say, well, well he, he said that of the scribes and Pharisees in his day. My dear friends, he's saying that of us today. He's saying that of the Laodicean church right now. We give him lip service, don't we? We know a lot about him. We've grasped abstract truths. We can discuss Christology and theology and soteriology and homartology and eschatology. And we like to debate on various doctrines and on the nature of Christ. 
but do we love Jesus with our whole hearts? Have we embraced him and yielded our wills to him? Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 2. He says this of Jerusalem, and by who, the way, who's Jerusalem represent? The church, his bride. She has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. My friends, why is it that we refuse to draw near to God? Because Wilma chooses to be drawn away and enticed by the old man's lusts. Altogether too much of the time. You see, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The flesh is drawing us this way. The spirit is drawing us that way. And you can't choose to yield to the lusts of the flesh and be drawn that way if you are going to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't, my friends. No man can serve two masters. No wife can serve two husbands. No will can serve two natures. I plead with you in behalf of Christ, choose you this day whom ye will serve. You've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice this day, and you've got to make a choice every single precious probationary day that remains. And the only way the only way you and I will be sufficiently motivated to make our choice for Jesus, to be drawn to him, is by beholding him crucified. What does he say? John 12, verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will what? Will draw all to myself. Will draw all to myself, is what the literal Greek says. Peoples have been added. The ultimate revelation of the love of God is made where, my dear friends? On Calvary's cross. This is where the drawing, attractive power of the love of God is most powerfully revealed. Do you better understand, perhaps in this context, why the servant of the Lord exhorts us to spend a thoughtful hour every day in contemplation of the life of Christ, but especially what? The closing scenes. Especially the closing scenes. You see, though his whole life reveals the loving kindnesses of God towards us, though his whole life is a revelation of love, that Love reaches its infinitely attractive and glorious climax as he makes that infinite sacrifice on the cross. No wonder John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb, the Lamb slain. My friends, I plead with you. Make that time every day, and you will be drawn to Christ. You will be entering into a deeper, more intimate, more precious, more meaningful love relationship with your divine spiritual husband, Jesus Christ. And he, more and more, will become 
the favorite seam of your thoughts, the most cherished object of your affections. And as he becomes more and more the favorite theme of your thoughts and more and more the object that your affections cherish, you will find yourself speaking of him more and more to others. And you will find ever-increasing joy and peace in that deepening love for Jesus Christ. My friends, how is that experience going to be ours? By feeding on his flesh and his blood. That's what the bridegroom himself said. Again, I commend to you the study of the Word of God. My dear friends, taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is good. Bride of Christ, in closing our study tonight, I want to share with you what I hope and pray will become your motto from this day forward. It's found in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. It's very easy to remember. It's only three words. Looking unto Jesus. Do you want to be a part of that wife who has made herself ready, my dear brother, sister? Do you? Who alone can make you ready? Only Jesus. Only by His Spirit can He change you from the naturally selfish and rebellious bride that you are into a loving and lovable bride that He alone can make you. And you are changed as you behold Him. You see, it's only in beholding that you are changed. Changed from glory to glory, from one stage of character to...